would know that you've said that the church is a house of prayer. And so we continue on our midweek on Wednesday to have time of prayer. And we pray, God, that those watching and those viewing us on our streaming, um, Lord, that you'd speak to them and uh, they would be filled and touched and blessed. And we thank you for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Those of you watching online and those of you that watch Sundays online as we stream, you're always welcome to come to our our morning worship service at 1045. We have a, a Bible study, a small group Bible studies, three adult studies, a college career study. We soon will have a youth study. It starts at 915. You're welcome to come and be a part of that. And our worship service begins at 1045. So we want to look into a couple of things from the Gospel of John, chapter 11. And I've titled this study, God's Silence and Delays. God's Silence and Delays. There are times it seems like God is silent. And it seems like there are times that God delays uh, his promises, his blessings. There is a thing about waiting upon the Lord. Waiting upon the Lord, being patient. And waiting is not not doing anything or being lazy. It's just trusting God. And here's a number one principle. God blesses what we prepare for. God blesses what we prepare for. And so, so much is preparation. If we don't prepare for anything, God's not likely going to bless us with anything. If we prepare for God's blessings, and if we prepare for God to do something, God more than likely is going to do something. Here's another principle the Holy Spirit is a wind. The Bible talks about the wind. And I, as a pastor, we as believers, and those of us that are in leadership in a church, we cannot create the wind of the Holy Spirit. As John chapter 3, Jesus said, it blows where it wants. It does what it wants. But here's what we can do. The wind of the Holy Spirit, we can set our sails to catch the wind. And God take us where he wants us to go. And we're in our Western culture, everything's instant. You know, instant potatoes, instant this, an instant account, an instant if a TV show isn't a success and high in the Nielsen ratings. You know, if they're not instant, they get canceled. Star Trek almost got canceled in its first year because it was not a success. Then later on, it became a, a success. And uh, we all know about Star Trek and and things, but God blesses what we prepare for, and it's strong to know to wait and uh, be patient and, and, and to wait. So we want to discuss God's silence and delays from the Gospel of John, the story of Mary and Martha and the death of their brother Lazarus. Uh, our church has been touched by death um, with the passing of Nathan Corrado, 22-year-old young man. And what is, what is interesting... Uh, we saw in the news Sunday morning about Kobe Bryant and the helicopter crash. He and his daughter that early Sunday morning went to their church in Newport, in Newport and had communion. And then uh, 10 o'clock went to this basketball tournament. Uh, the day before, Saturday at the Nathan Corrado Memorial, my first point, my first application of my very, very brief very, very brief memorial sermon was the vulnerability of life. The vulnerability of life. And you could be rich or poor, you could be a superstar, you could be famous, you could be in obscurity or relative obscurity. It, that, it doesn't matter. There's a vulnerability of life in the 49 years and 10 and a half months that I've been a pastor. As I recall, I can tell you a number of times, I've always done the handshake line on Sunday morning after the sermon, shake hands, greet people, greet visitors. We now give them gift bags, uh, guest gift bag for first time visitors. And it has some material about our church, some information, uh, an FAQ and, and things. And, uh, and so, but I've always made it a point to shake hands, call people out by name and, and things. And I can't tell you how many times that was the last time I saw them on a Sunday morning. Uh, 
my first time as a young rookie pastor when that happened, it shook me to the core. And I realized uh, that, you know, everybody has an expiration date. So I mentioned that at Nathan's uh, memorial, the, the vulnerability of life. Number one, the vulnerability of life. But I also talk about the value of life, no matter who you are. Whether you're a straight-A valedictorian in your high school, or you're a gangbanger, b-boy, or whatever you are, a musician, athlete, a student, uh, that there's value. There's vulnerability to life, and there's value to life. We have value because we're made and created in the image and likeness of God. We have an accountability and responsibility to God, and God has breathed into us the breath of life. We are a living soul encased in this body. We are a living soul. And so technically, biblically, it's not that we have a soul as an organ like a kidney or a spleen or, you know, we are a living soul. God breathed into us the breath of life, and we are encased and living in a, a body that, of course, it deteriorates, but the soul lives on forever. What is the soulish nature of us, the, the, the living soul that we are? What makes us think, what makes us love, what makes us cry, what gives us emotion, love, and hate. And that's who we really are, and that lives forever. That lives forever. Uh, so we had the Nathaniel, Nathan Memorial, and then this Saturday on the 8th, this Saturday we have our men's breakfast at 8 o'clock, but the next Saturday on the 8th we have the memorial. We have the memorial for Nadine Fry, Jesse Fry's wife. Mm -hmm. And I see the contrast here. Uh, Nathan, a young, age 22, murdered. He was the first murderer. I believe, in California in 2020. And then Nadine uh, had a long-term illness and sickness. And in the back of the family's mind, uh, Jesse, uh, the children, uh, uh, their Darlene, Jeanette, and Steve, who lives way up in Northern California. And Jeanette lives up in Geyserville, up in Northern California. It is expected, but still when it happens, it hurts. And we see the contrast of a young life snuffed out and an older life. Uh, death is not discriminant. I think I, I, I'll never forget when I was speaking on the Billy Graham Crusade team, and four or five times a year they flew me out to speak where he or Franklin Graham were doing crusades. And I, I spoke at various venues when Billy Graham was younger, when he did his crusades. You had the stadium crusade, but within a 100-mile radius, he would go out and preach in colleges, universities. He would preach to sports facilities during the daytime, especially military camps and prisons. So they called me uh, and asked if I would be willing to fill in for Mr. Graham on his outside speaking engagements. And uh, I spoke in military bases and prisons, some of these activities. And so I remember in the San Francisco crusade uh, that was at the Cow Palace, um, on the Tuesday, Graham's crusades would go from Thursday to Sunday. Tuesday, there's always the press conference where he faces the press. And I remember that the press conference was at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco on a Tuesday. Mr. Graham and myself went up an elevator and walked into the Commonwealth Club together along uh, with T.W. Wilson, his personal assistant. And uh, in that press conference, uh, it was a year anniversary of the death of Mother Teresa and Princess Diana. They both died in the same week. So it was a year anniversary of the death of Mother Teresa and the death of Princess Diana. And in the press conference, uh, one of the reporters asked, Billy Graham, and said, uh, it was a year ago this week that Princess Diana and Mother Teresa died. How, how would you assess, Mr. Graham, uh, that, that situation? <laughs> and uh, spontaneously, Dr. Graham said, well, there's a lesson right there. These two teach us about life. Princess Diana teaches us about the brevity of life, and Mother Teresa teaches us about the meaning of life and the service 
in life. And he, off the, off the top of his head, he just contrasted one young, one older, one sudden death, one sudden death. Uh, Michelle and I, when I preached in Europe, and we toured Europe in a preaching thing, and she went with me. We were in Paris, and we were driven down that little tunnel thing where the crash happened. We, we were there, and I recognized it uh, from uh, the news. So from our own church and passing and, uh, and things, we see uh, the lesson, uh, the lesson of the brevity of life and the meaning of life. And with that in mind, we see the death of Mary and Martha's brother, Lazarus. And so let me read, beginning with John 11. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. And we know Mary and Martha, they were sisters. And every church, every church needs a Mary and a Martha. So if you're a lady uh, watching us, and we have ladies here, uh, Mary and Martha were sisters, but they were different. Uh, if you have multiplicity of kids, if you've had more than one child, you have three or four children, it's amazing that they still came from the same mother, same father, but they're all four different. Different in attitudes, different in aspects, and I saw that in our own three kids. And so Martha is the worker. Martha is the one that is always busy, always doing things. Mary was a little more contemplating, laid back, and... She liked to sit at the feet of Jesus, and both are valuable. Martha is the one that would do the dishes after the potluck in church. Martha is the one that would change the diapers in the nursery Sunday morning. Mary is the spiritual and uh, the one that would want to pray and be devoted, but Jesus blessed both, and Jesus explained both their value, and there's an incident in Luke about the sisters, you know, Martha complaining to Jesus that I've got a lot to do to prepare for this banquet, and my sister isn't helping me. She just wants to pray, and there's a balance, all right, an equilibrium. So, with that in mind, now Lazarus uh, of Bethany, the village of Mary and Martha, her sister Martha, it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. And the sisters, verse 3, sent word to him, saying, Behold, Lord, he that you love is, is sick. So first thing, we see that Jesus loved Lazarus. The word loved here is not the typical Greek word for love, which is agape or agapeo. It's the word phileo. In other words, they had a, a bond, a, a male bond. There's four words in the Bible in Greek that, that capture love. First one is a, on a equal fellowship basis. And that's how Christ loves us. The God Here's the thing. Mary and Martha get word to Jesus 20 miles, away, 20 miles away. To us, that's just a commute. In fact, for some, an easy commute. Most people commute much farther traffic. And, but you have to remember, they either walked or got there by, uh, you know, a donkey or, you know, um, a cart or something. And so... Verse 4, when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness is not end in death, but for the glory of God, so the Son of God may be glorified by it. God does things with us whereby he gets glorified. And I'm praying and trusting that the death of Nathan, God will be glorified by some young, young, young men that were his friends and buddies and in, involved together in some uniformity, okay? in clothing and other things, that this will be to the glory of God. This will be to the glory of God. God will use it. And uh, at least this Sunday, uh, Nancy was here, and uh, the father, uh, Marcella, was here, and Layla was here. And uh, I talked with Nancy this morning and, and prayed with her. And now after the memorial and everything, 
you know, you're tied up, you're busy now, after that everything really hits and that's always, uh, you know, so she was here when she dropped off her child in our preschool daycare and, and uh, Sandy counseled with her and I came and talked with her and, and prayed with her and she said she wants to get back involved in, in church again. And so, but uh, you're the one that fusses over everything. I've noticed in this church, we, uh, I'm just going to be polite and tender. We have some fussy people about getting things done, getting things right. Uh, praise God for women in the kitchen and uh, praise God for all the work and all the Marthas, male and female, in our Thanksgiving outreach and dinner. After this, uh, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. And that's basically where Mary and Martha were. A disciple said to him, Rabbi, teacher, the Jews were just seeking to stone you and kill you. Are you going there also? So uh, he goes on in verse 11. He said to them, our friend Lazarus has sleep, but I go so that I may, wa I may awaken him out of sleep. So getting to the focus of, of, of the study here, the God of silence, we see a grace of silence where God teaches us to trust him, to trust him even when things don't look good. Even dealing with a few of our families that I've talked to and prayed with, uh, you know, when the shutoff notice comes from the utility company and there's more month than money, I think we've all been there at one time or another. And and things, even when things don't look good, that, that we trust God. We see the grace of silence. It's, it's, it's training and trusting. I was talking to two people this week, one at Starbucks, and I forget uh, where the other one was. I asked me about why are there so many denominations? Okay. Oh, yeah, it was our families that visited that I saw, and, uh, you know, I told them that we're a Baptist church. They've attended twice and intend to join the church. They've been in Greg's Sunday School class twice, and as we talked, the person said, we're looking for a Southern Baptist church. <laughs> and I said, we are a Southern Baptist church. We're not a secret one, but we use the name Arbor Christian Fellowship because we're in the Arbor area. We want to relate to our community.
Christians, and they're doing big PR now to be normal Christians, but historically they are not mainstream, biblical, theological, doctrinally Christians. And they have a religion by works. The other denomination is one. It's religion by the work of Christ on the cross. Hallelujah. So there's only two, only two denominations in essence. In essence. Now, the reality in the Christian life, uh, each of the main denominations, uh, especially the ones that came out of the so-called Reformation in 1517, the next couple of hundred years, uh, are... are the way they are and have the name they have because of a certain emphasis in their faith community. For instance, the Methodists have an affinity for holiness and sinlessness. And they often teach that you reach a point where you never sin again. And it's called perfection. It doesn't happen as long as we're here and human. Uh, we don't. We still sin. We sin less. Often it's a sin of omission. Uh, we will be totally perfect and sinless in heaven. Uh, our Pentecostal brother and sister emphasize the Holy Spirit, uh, but they don't know that the term baptism of the Holy Spirit is originally a Baptist term from, from, from way back. The Presbyterians emphasize the sovereignty of God and God's election from eternity past and then locking it in through Jesus Christ. Baptists emphasize immersion, not for salvation, but immersion as a sign of our salvation. Romans 6, 4, we're buried with a baptism, we're raised to new life. So when we go in the water, we identify with Christ's death on the cross. When we're in the water for a couple of split seconds, um, we identify with Christ's death and his burial, and as we're raised up, we identify with his resurrection. It's a great profession of faith. It is the best profession of faith, and it's done publicly. So we emphasize baptism. A lot of Baptists died and were martyred because in the 1500s, early 1600s, uh, many of the ruling magistrates uh, outlawed second baptism or being rebaptized because babies were sprinkled because the Roman Catholic Church taught if you weren't sprinkled as a baby, you were never baptized, you go to hell. So they baptized and sprinkled babies. When the Reformation came, and two men, Conrad Grebel and Felix Mainz, in Zurich, Switzerland, Baptist in belief, Baptist in belief, authority of the Bible, local congregation, no institution, chain of command to pray. You don't pray through the saints. You don't pray through the pastor. You don't pray through Mary, but you go direct to God. They had these Baptistic views, and they began to start people that believe the same way, baptize them in the river Limnot in Zurich, Switzerland. I stood at that river point where many of the Anabaptists, it's called Anabaptist. Anna means, again, Baptist, baptized. Again, baptized or rebaptized. 1611, in England, they dropped the Anna and became Baptist. Baptist. And those Baptists there, many of them were persecuted and executed in the River Limnot. They took those leaders and people that became Anabaptists, they would take them and drown them in the water. Or you want to be immersed? Okay, we'll immerse you. And they drowned them. Many, many more. Many, many died to bear the Baptist name. And so I, I told that couple, yeah, we're a Southern Baptist church. I'm not ashamed of being, the, of being Baptist. And the decision to change the name was an evangelistic decision, not a doctrinal one. We still adhere um, uh, uh, to that. So getting back to our, our thing here, the goal of silence is a test, and then the glory that comes from God moving is, is truth. Twice Jesus says in verse 4, For thy glory, for the glory, that the Son of God may be glorified. So we see, here's the application for us before we go ahead and, and pray. God's silence in our lives. And we, when we think God isn't doing anything, when we think God's not working, 
that often is a revelation and a graduation to a bigger revealing of God himself and the presence of God in us and a graduation to a greater usefulness in ministry, whether at home, in the marketplace, or in our church, or, or, or wherever. It's, it's a graduation. Often God works in silence and tests us. We're to trust him. And it's all of God's truth. I'll give one illustration, and then we'll be finishing up. Our time is, is running out. So those of you that are watching online, and those of us here, if we've gone through some times where we felt God, you know, where are you? Where are you? Nancy asked me this morning, where, where was God when they murdered my boy? When, where was he? Where was God? And, uh, you know... God doesn't work through cliches and pat answers. Those don't bring heart relief. And I said where God always was, on his throne. But I want you to know that there were angels present when God took your son home. He did not die alone. There were angels present and, and things. Where was God? There was a book. There was a book published, Where Was God at 9.15 a.m.? Uh, about where was God during the Murrah building uh, when uh, that place blew up in Oklahoma City. And uh, being part of the Marine Corps League in Northern California, two Marines died at the Murrah building uh, there in Oklahoma City. And uh, they were in the recruiting uh, office uh, there. One of those Marines' mother lived in Alameda when I was pastoring in Fremont, California. And because I was a chaplain in the Marine Corps League for the San Francisco Bay Area, I got to minister and visit with the mom and uh, make a death call. But, you know, and the guys of the Marine Corps League and being the Marine Corps League chaplain, prayed with her and, 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 and talked to her. And about six months after all that, Michelle and I, I had speaking opportunities in Oklahoma uh, Dell City for Southern Baptist Church, Oklahoma City, preaching. And uh, we went and visited the Murrah building. And this was before they put all the monuments there. Uh, they had everything chain-linked, fenced off. You could see a gaping hole in the wall. And, you know, there were tons of preschool. You know, we have a preschool here. And that, that place had a preschool. And there were children that died in that preschool. And so I remember there was a chain-link fence to keep, you know, from people going into the depression there in the ground. Mm -hmm. And those chain link fence had actual teddy bears and toys and stuffed animals attached or tied on. And there was a section for the two Marines. We, we have, you know, two other Marines here, Vic and Paul and myself. And they had a whole display of pictures of those two Marines and we stood there and I, I told Michelle that, yeah, I ministered to that guy's mother uh, uh, there, uh, that, that memorial and the book. Where was God at 915? You know, where was God at 911? Where, where, where is God? He's where he always is. And we don't see everything on this side. We don't see everything on this side of eternity. So Mary and Martha, especially Martha, was, was nonplussed about Jesus not showing up. And so we want to wrap up with John 11, 25, 26. Uh, Jesus got there. Verse 14, Jesus said, Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. He died. And verse 15, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. God had something better. Instead of Jesus healing Lazarus and he doesn't die, he dies. But guess what's going to happen? Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Not a real resurrection, but a resuscitation because Lazarus would die later on. It's a resuscitation. And this is the last and final of the seven sign miracles in John's Gospel. First one, he fed the 5,000. Second, he, you know, he stilled the waters and healed a person. Uh, 
the next to the last one was he healed a blind man. Each of the miracle, sign miracles that he did, the seven of them in John's Gospel, each one was progressively difficult in the nature of things. And of course, the most difficult, raising a dead person. Jesus raised three people, or resuscitated three people in the Gospels. One was a young, a young, 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 young child. Maybe Carly's age or a year or two younger. Second was a young lad, a young boy, maybe in his early 20s. And the third was an older man, Lazarus. And he counterbalanced the sin that brought death from the garden. It is a point unto men who wants to die. Sin, Adam and Eve's disobedience, brought death. But Jesus healed a young girl when sin and nature and is fresh. A, 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 an older, younger man when you live at a time that sin sometimes can run rampant as, as a young person. Then an older man, Lazarus. Lazarus, whose sin would be affecting him. And he conquered. He conquered. He conquered. So, uh, it, it says here that uh, he arrives... Uh, and verse 18, now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. Verse 18, many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha uh, to console them concerning their brother. There was a funeral type thing going on. By the way, back in those days, the Jews would hire professional mourners to weep and wail and roll on the floor and be in pain for a funeral, for a memorial. They would hire professional mourners, and they did also... In, in this case, and I've seen it all in, in my 50, almost 50 years. I've done so many hundreds of funerals and memorials. I've seen everything. I've seen where the funeral, I've seen two or three times where the funeral director and myself literally physically had to pry a family member off the coffin. Once the coffin was closed, open coffin, people passed by and reviewed. And then everybody goes out to the cars for the funeral cortege. And, of course, in those days, a policeman would accompany. They don't do that as much anymore. And then the funeral director and I'm standing with the family, the mother, the father, the daughter, the brother, the sister, and they close the, the casket. And they have a time of mourning. And I've seen where the funeral director and myself before they put the coffin in the hearse, we had to literally, and they were strong, even ladies, to pry them off. Usually it comes when there's a situation in the family where there's a broken family where people haven't talked to each other in years. Or there's been a distancing between mother and daughter, father and son, brother and sister, daughter and mother, and they've stopped talking. And they never reconciled. Most often, it happens if there's a sudden death. There's a sudden death and, and things. And so, uh, let's, let's go on. Verse 18, Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Okay, I understand that. You understand that. But God always has a better thing he's going to do. 22, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, check this out, your brother will rise again. And Martha, the practical one, not the deep spiritual one like her sister, but the practical one, she was also spiritually devoted. He just showed it in different ways. Martha said to him, I know I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on that last day. She's talking about an event. Jesus is talking about a person. Verse 25, 26, and I close with that. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. The Gospel of John is a book of ultimate confessions of who Jesus is. Chapter 1 calls him a teacher, a prophet. Uh, later on, it talks about Son of God, 
here Martha says, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. The same confession Peter made in Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16. Who do men say that I am? Oh, you're a prophet. You're Jeremiah. You're Elijah. Oh, you're that prophet to come. That's from Deuteronomy 18. Then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that? And Peter got it right. There are a lot of times he got it right. We always hmm. bash him, you know, for foot and mouth disease. But he got a lot of things right. And he made that confession. The ultimate confession in the Gospel of John is at the end of the book when doubting Thomas, pouting Thomas, doubting Thomas, who refused to go to the first Sunday night church service, he just didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And when the other disciples invited him to come, he just says, No, I will not come. I will not believe Jesus rose until I see the nail prints and the side, and until I put my finger in the nail prints. Well, they convinced him and invited him, and Thomas is there the next service a week later, and somehow Jesus appears physically, bodily, not a spook, not an angel, not a fan. It was a pure bodily resurrection on Easter Sunday, and uh, Peter had probably the one that invited, and then Thomas looks at Jesus and says, my Lord, my God. The greatest confession, mm -hmm. my Lord, my God. He made it personal. It was passionate. He, The Greek uh, grammar says that he shouted it out. It, it, it was personal, his confession, passionate, and it was permanent. He is permanent Lord and God. Permanent Lord and God. So I am the resurrection. Um, we need to remember it's not an event, but it's a person that we worship. We have holidays and calendars, and Mary and Martha knew about the last day. But Jesus said, it's not an event, it's not even a day. It's me. It's, it's me. So the last thing in your study sheet, the sentence is Jesus changes every graveyard to a grace yard. Jesus went to three funerals. He broke all three of them up by raising or resuscitating the deceased. Jesus changes every graveyard into a grace yard. Perhaps there's a situation in your home or in your family, and it's kind of a graveyard. Uh, they're just, uh, things are dying. Maybe love, passion, commitment financial clout, these kind of things, they're dying. They're dying. Maybe in the marketplace, uh, uh, their things uh, are just not going all that well. It's kind of a graveyard. Jesus takes every graveyard and changes it into a grace yard. Amen. Well, God bless you. Uh, those of you watching online will sign off. Come see us Sunday, 1045, worship uh, service. Glad you're with us. Hit that you saw us, uh, make a comment. I look at those, and I take them very deeply and seriously and things. So let us know you're out there. God bless you.